this for me is a really, really hard sell. Because I'm pretty well, as far as I know, I'm the only person I know who thinks this is a really great way to present the gospel. And most people are fairly cynical, saying it won't work in my culture. Don't you know Who wants to argue with people? David, you're saying this because you like arguing. And then we start an argument. So that kind of proves, kind of proves the point. Um, so I want to ask, first of all, is debating biblical? Because there's something deeply hardwired into most modern European culture which says, especially Christians, don't argue with people because it's not nice. There are two cultural things here. Number one is, in the general culture, is everyone's opinion is to be respected, admired, or whatever. And you mustn't contradict people's opinions or experience. And in the Christian context, in the Christian culture, uh, there's also the question of niceness. Christians have to be nice. And I want to scream and headbutt the person who says that. And no, I, I'm not, not naturally violent, but how is it nice just to let people go on in, in ways that are wrong and doing so much harm? You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Now, part of that for me is cultural. I grew up in a culture where we, we would discuss things and argue about things. My wife, I remember when I first started dating my wife, I went to her home and I loved her father instantly because he would have people in from the church and he would start arguing with them. And they would all argue together and they would get quite passionate. And then they would finish and just, you know, have a drink together and, and talk. And now, it seems to me as though people say, well, we, we can't disagree with one another, we can't. And my friend Tom here, he'll tell you this, I, I'm useless at this. I sit and meet with people and say, well, what do you think of that? And I'll go, I thought it was rubbish. And then they get all upset and they say, well, no, don't, you know. I said, well, okay, I might be wrong, but I thought it was rubbish. What do you think of the talk last night? Oh, it wasn't up to much. You know, you say, oh, I thought it was wonderful. Or, You're not allowed to say anything negative. And people associate debating with being negative. But for me, debating is not being negative. It's trying to find out truth. It's trying to say, what do you think? And why do you think? And I want to know. I want to ask. I want to question. So it's a means of finding truth. And in terms of being biblical, I would argue it's phenomenally biblical. I challenge you to go through the book of Acts, especially the early chapters, and find how many times it says the apostles reasoned or debated. It says even they debated from house to house. The classic chapter, of course, you've got Acts 17. Well, what is Paul doing there? He is debating, he is discussing, he is debating, he's challenging. And I think debating is a great, great way of communicating the truth of Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry that so few Christians and so church, so few churches don't understand and don't grasp how this can be really, really helpful in communicating the gospel. What is the point of going to someone and saying, believe in Jesus, if they don't know who Jesus is, they don't know what belief is, and they think that you're telling them to do something completely different from what you think you're telling them? So debate helps crystallize things if it's done properly. Jesus debated a lot. Absolutely. Is debating culturally relevant? Well, that's, I've already kind of partly answered that. I've already partly, you know, I would argue how you do it, yes, it will depend. Now, I do hear different objections. Some of my Greek friends say, oh, David, you Scottish people are all intellectual. You like to argue. Greeks don't like to argue. And I'm like, what? Greeks don't like to argue. Let me talk to your wife. What do you mean? I, I haven't met any people yet who don't like to argue. We just argue in different ways, and we communicate in different ways. Is debating culturally relevant? I would argue it is, and I would argue that you, you, you would obviously contextualize it in different ways. Uh, we'll see that there are different ways of debating. So let's talk about some of the different types of debate that there are. Uh, formal university town hall. Now, this may not be the way that you are used to doing it in your culture, you see. But in some British universities, it's, done, it's really it's quite extraordinary. I'll give you the best example I know, because it's the worst as well. St. Andrews University, they're really posh. They're full of people who didn't make it to Oxford and Cambridge, and they think they're better than anyone else in Scotland. So I get invited out to the debating society, and it's based around the Houses of Parliament style. And these people who really think that they are something special, they wear red gowns, they sit opposite each other, they have four speakers on each side when they do a debate. Each speaker gets about four minutes, that's all, four or five minutes. And people will go, hear, hear, 
ha, 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 and then they'll stamp their feet or something, and then people will challenge you. You're standing speaking, someone will stand up, and the others will shout out, gown, gown. The first time I heard it, I thought they were shouting out, down, down. They weren't. They were shouting, gown, put your gown on. You have to have your gown on to speak. And then they would, you know, it was just all incredibly posh and incredibly pretentious and just, I hated it. And I went there and I didn't get invited back because I said, uh, St. Andrews is about 15 miles from my city. It's a small town. And I said to them, it's really nice to come out to the suburbs. And they were just really, really annoyed at that. And they, they, you know, they were so pretentious and awful. And I said, I think it's jolly nice that the Christians come to our debating society. And I think that, I said, yes. I said, well, I think it's nice too. I said, I, I'm not used to debating with idiots. And I said, what, you can't say that? I said, yes, I can, because you're thinking it about me. And I said, I'm thinking it about you. So let's be honest. I said, I think, it, you know, and okay, that's, that's one extreme. Formal university town hall, you'll get that. You'll often hear, for example, William Lane Craig, John Lennox, people like that you would invite to debate. They would be asked to debate a, a notable atheist, a leading politician, a scientist or something. It would be a formal debate, 15 minutes, questions, five minutes summing up, voting even. Um, there is a place for that. It can be done, and it can be done really well, and I've seen it done really well. And I think William Lane Craig, is absolutely superb. In fact, he's so good, it's very difficult to try and get people to debate against him. Um, the next one is the kind of inf informal, cafe communities type of debate. Now, when we looked at the cafe evangelism, part of it was, in a sense, that's what I try and provoke. I try and go into a place and try and get people to discuss and to debate. But one of the ways that you can do the cafe evangelism, or you can do the community hall, or you can do the church thing, is you ask yourself, you or somebody else can speak on the Christian side, someone else can speak on another side. It can be on particular topics. It's usually better if it is, rather than just general. Um, you, each of you, it would, there would not be a formal motion, voting, show of hands, so on. Each of you would speak for an allotted period of time. You would have an opportunity to talk to one another. And in that sense, in the cliche terms, it's much more dialogue. If you're going to do that, you have to make sure you have two people who are roughly equal and have a respect for each other and who treat each other with respect. Otherwise, it can get really, really uh, nasty. I've found that the dialogue type of debate is phenomenal. I love it. And I especially love doing it in a hostile environment. So the local gay society invites me to come and speak and do a debate with them. I'm there. I will do that. Um, the first time I did that in one place. I'm sorry, but this is such a stereotype. But there was two guys sitting at the front knitting, and I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> but we had a great time. We had a good discussion. Um, the Islamic society was a little bit more different. Uh, but that was really, really good as well. There was one woman in a burqa who came up to me after we'd done it, and she said, David, do you really believe, you really believe that God is sovereign, that there's a heaven and a hell, that God created the earth, that the Bible is God's word? I said, yes, I do. With all. I said, you are an amazing Christian. I said, thank you. Uh, I said, you are an amazing Christian. I've never met a, all Christians make excuses and they don't, but you, you believe what, she said, you are almost a Muslim. <laughs> and I started laughing and said, maybe you're almost a Christian. So I said, anyway, what are you doing talking to me? You've got a burqa on and your husband's up at the back. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, but he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was wonderful. Now, I would never have had that conversation with that woman if we hadn't had that debate and discussion. So for me as a Christian, I would much rather go into what I would call enemy territory or uncomfortable territory and do that because I just love that kind of dialogue with people. But you can do it the other way around as well. Church, that's the third one. Debates in church. A lot of churches hate this, and so they won't do it. Uh, I've done it. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult for some Christians because someone's standing up in their church and saying that there isn't a God or that Jesus didn't rise from the dead or raising lots of questions and doubts. And a lot of churches don't like to see that happening. I personally do because I think they're the kinds of questions that the people in our churches are going to be facing anyway. And it's just as well to be facing them there, discussing there, as anywhere else. But if you do try and hold a debate in a church, uh, know your constituency. 
The other problem with the debate in a church is sometimes you will get the place packed out with Christians and non-Christians won't come. Because for them, it's enemy territory. Um, and sometimes the ones who can come can be very, very, very hostile. So, yeah, it's so worth doing. Principles of debating. Uh, number one, a clear question. Make sure if you're having a debate, especially if it's a formal one, that the question is clear. Belief in God is a delusion, for example, uh, is, a, is, a, is a clear question. A good God would not allow suffering is a clear statement that you might want to debate. You, you've got to do that because otherwise you're going to have people wandering off onto all kinds of different paths and getting very frustrated and very angry. So a clear idea of what you are discussing what you are debating about, what you are dialoguing about. Number two, and it's a huge important principle of debating, is you are not there to win the argument, but you should. You know, I love winning the argument, I'm not going to deny that. But you, you are there to win the person, which is a cliche. You do not win the person by be, being patronizing, going, oh yes, 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 I agree with you. No, you don't. You, if, if you respect someone, you respect them enough to disagree with them. But the most important thing in all of this is we have to listen to what people are saying. Because otherwise you end up arguing against something that they're not saying. And they will get very, rightly, they will get very angry with you. And also when the same thing happens to you, you would get really, really hurt by that. So I would say this for all evangelism, for anything. Listen to what people are saying. Not what you think they might be saying. Not what the, you, you've read in your Christian manual, they will be saying, but what are they really, really saying? So, I mean, let me give you uh, kind of a couple of clear examples. One is, I remember a woman standing up and asking me, well, actually, it, was, it wasn't a Bible study discussion, but it was a dialogue thing. And she said, well, what do you think about suffering? And I gave her just a brilliant answer. I mean, honestly, uh, C.S. Lewis had nothing on it. It was just a great answer about the problem of pain and philosophically and so on and everything. And I was really pleased with myself. I was a young minister, and boy, I knocked that one dead. I was so happy. I was like, yes, got it. Go, you know. And she went out afterwards and went into the kitchen. She was making some tea and coffee. And one of the women came up and said to me, do you know who that was? I said, no. I said, that's Richard's mum. Now, Richard was a famous child in Scotland who had been born healthy and had got an injection and became severely handicapped, um, brain, really brain damaged, physically damaged, and his mum was famous, they made a documentary about her, she gave up her job, looked after him and so on. She went through torture for years because she was responsible for giving the injection. She could have asked that the injection be given. I felt that small. I went through the kitchen and I said, I am really sorry. I said, I gave you an answer. I had no idea who you were. I said, I must have appeared like a complete plonker to you. Sorry, plonker, I don't know how that translates, but idiot or, you know. And she looked at me and she just, she just said, that's all right, son. She said, you didn't know. And, and that was true, I didn't know, you know. I, but it taught me a huge, huge lesson. I didn't hear the question she was really asking. The question she was really asking is, why did I have to go through that suffering? What did my son do? See, I didn't know that. So you'll notice what Jesus does a lot of the time. When someone asks a question, he asks another one back. And not because he's trying to avoid the question or delay, but he's trying to find out where someone's coming from. Someone asks me, what do you think about homosexuality? Maybe they've struggled with homosexuality and they want to commit suicide. I, I give them a very different answer to somebody who's saying, why are you such a, homose why are you such a homophobic bigot? Because a lot of questions are not questions, they're accusations. My favorite question ever in that regard was a guy who stood up and said, why are you such an idiot? It's not really a question. He's not inquiring after my mental well-being. Uh, my answer, which was really bad, and please don't do anything like this, it was a really bad answer. I said to him, so that I could have an incarnational ministry with someone like you. And I said, <laughs> and, and it got worse because I said, and when we're finished, I'll explain what incarnational means. <laughs> oh, God. Sometimes I have to pray the Lord forgives me for <laughs> things you say. But you got to listen. Listen to people, okay? Three things as well. This is a, uh, those of you who know your, your ancient Greeks, your Aristotelian laws of speaking. 
Elucidation, education, entertainment. Speak clearly. Do not take part in a public debate if you cannot articulate your words. I am in, uh, elucidation, uh, elucidate, make it clear. Make it clear because um, I, I loved it. I remember one lady came up to me and she's from India and she said to her husband, you have to meet David, you have to meet David. And I said, why does he have to meet me? She said, he speaks such good English. I said, well, yeah, that's my first and only language, really. A bit of Dutch, but apart from that, you know, I, I'm, I'm stuck with it. But uh, I, I'm amazed at how many people have come to different events because, you know, you can speak, you, you've got to speak clearly. There's no point in debating if you cannot speak clearly. People don't understand what you're saying. Uh, so for me, that's an important thing. Um, education, when you're debating, you've got to inform. Don't just stand up and yell opinions at people. I'm right, you're wrong. No, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you know. I mean, that doesn't work. You've got to inform people. Give them information that will cause them to go, wait a minute. So, religion is the source of all evil in the world. That's interesting. Because 90% of the medical world, work in the world comes because of religious people. The vast majority of it because of Christians. You give people information, real information. Uh, it does two things. One, it shows that you're thinking and you've got some information. And two, it causes them to question. And you entertain. Now, you've got to be careful with that. Uh, I was asking in another seminar about the use of humor. Uh, use humor, but don't stand up and say, let me tell you a joke. Especially when you're doing cross-cultural, because it doesn't... When I'm in America and I say things that are really serious, people burst out laughing. When I tell them jokes, they want to hit me. <laughs> you know, I don't... Sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, uh, we... <laughs> We've had quite a lot of Scandinavians in our congregation over the years, you know, and I still haven't worked out the Finnish sense of humor, um, if it exists, or, where, you know, how it is. And English people joke about the Germans that they have no sense of humor. But entertainment, your talk, your debating should actually be quite entertaining without you doing a stand-up comedy show. That, that's quite important. Uh, interaction. It, if you're debating, there's got to be dialogue. So you're talking to people, look at them. Ravi Zacharias is brilliant at this. He can be in a crowd of a thousand people, someone asks him a question, he'll say, stand up please so that I can see you. And he'll talk to them. That is really vital. Uh, when I do debates with people, I try and get it so that we get some degree of respect. I did a debate with an atheist in Glasgow three months ago. He actually lives in Edinburgh. I went to speak in Edinburgh. I dropped him a Facebook message and said, do you want to come to this? And he came. And I was amazed. And one of the reasons he came was because he and I got on really well during that debate. We strongly disagreed, but there was a mutual respect. And um, I mean, I'm, in fact, one of the things I've got to do while I'm here is arrange another debate with him uh, at Dundee University uh, for when we go back. Fifth thing, communicate Christ. In all apologetics, I'm astounded at how many times I see people have an argument about science, have an argument about morality, have an argument about God, and all that they do at most is convince people to be deists or theists. It's about Jesus. And you, there's, there's a way you don't do that. You don't do, you know, point A, point B, and point C is always believe in Jesus. What you're doing is you're showing people how your faith in Christ connects to everything that you are saying. So um, with the homosexuality debate, for example, I've, uh, please, if you, if you want, come to the seminar where we look at how you use that to communicate Christ. But I think that's possible. I think in any debate, you can communicate Christ. I will give you one example. During a, a, a debate on homosexuality I was doing with a government advisor, um, we, we talked about lots of, lots of different things, discussed different things, and then a man stood up, and it was lovely because the church was half filled with gay activists, and the other half were basically West Indian Pentecostals. And one of the West Indian Pentecostals stood up and he said, I'd like to ask both the speakers, what is your hope? And my opponent stood up, and he was a liberal politician, he said, my hope is I can raise the tax ceiling for the poor to £10,000 a year. And I looked at him and thought, you're serious, that's your hope in life. My goodness, what a sad life. But anyway, I stood up and I said, I'm sorry to speak in religious cliche, but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, at which all the Pentecostals went, hallelujah, where? <laughs> and all, and all, the, all the gay activists went, what? <laughs> And then I explain what it meant. But you can do that. You, can, you, you want to communicate who Jesus Christ is. That's got to be true for everything. 
Uh, what can go wrong? People. That's what can go wrong. Because uh, it's like a teacher I know said, teaching would be great if there weren't any pupils. A doctor I know said, medicine would be fantastic if there weren't any patients. <laughs> you know, people can go wrong. People can argue. People can get upset. People, I once had a guy, it wasn't debating me, but he was in the audience. He wanted to try and hit me. Um, and there was another guy who stood up, this was in London, and he yelled at the back, he said, I cannot believe what you have just said. I cannot believe it. And his face was, eyes were popping, and I thought, okay, Lord, if he comes up and hits me, do I really turn the other cheek, or can I deck him first? <laughs> because I, I'm not into this martyrdom stuff, you know. And I thought, he's really, really angry. And I said, excuse me, sir, I'm really sorry to have upset you, but why have I upset you? He said, how dare you say I'm a sinner? And I said, oh, whoa, you need to back off. You need to stop. Wait. Before you go any further, let me tell you this. I will say that you are a sinner. You are a sinner. Don't get mad at me. I said, but I want to tell you something like this. I am a sinner, and I'm a worse sinner than you. Because you know nothing about God. Even the very nature of your question means you know nothing. I do. Therefore, I'm sinning with greater knowledge. Therefore, my sin is great, greater. And he just looked at me and said, you're saying you're a sinner? I said, yes, sir, I am. I am absolutely a sinner. And that was so mind-blowing for him. Now, you see, the thing that you can do in that, you can start saying, yes, you're a sinner. The Bible says you're a sinner. And this is, you know, no, he, he had no concept of what sin was. And you have to relate sin to Christ and sin to yourself. And ultimately, you relate everything to Christ. So you communicate Christ. Um, people can be easily offended as well. I, I, honestly, I'm offended at people being offended. Uh, I just, it does my head in, you know, oh, you've offended me. Well, grow up. You know, honestly, it just, uh, people take offense at every tiny little thing. Um, I, I work on the basis of be an equal opportunity offender. I hope to offend everybody. Um, not deliberately. You don't deliberately. You're a fool if you go out to offend people. But when people start saying, don't say that or you'll hurt me, that's it. Okay, let me finish. Um, the opponent, that can be a problem. It can be, the opponent can be too easy. If that's the case, don't mock him. Let him hang himself or herself. You know, I've seen that happen. Um, you can find yourself that there's a problem because of pride, because of defensiveness, because of self-centeredness, and the only solution to that is biblical humility. It's not about me. It cannot be about you. And the last is the church. That can go wrong. People can be upset. They can ask, what's the point? I've done debates in a member of Baptist church in London that half the congregation were really upset at the guy who organized it because they thought it was bringing unnecessary argument and he said to them, listen, there were a hundred people who heard the gospel tonight because of this debate. But they were still upset. Um, they just don't understand. But I think it is so worth doing. And I think we need to learn to debate and discuss at a one-to-one -one level, first of all. That's most important. At a group level and in public and in the media. And we need to train people to do that. I've been doing it. I did it when I was at university, 1979 to 1983 in student politics. 20 years later, I got asked to start doing this kind of stuff in bookshops. And I was thinking, Lord, why did you wait 20 years for me to do this? I love doing this. And the answer was, because now you've got 20 years pastoral experience and 20 years learning and 20 years. And you can use all the gifts you had before, but with a lot more knowledge than you did. And I think we need to be training people long term for doing this kind of work. It's essential. Thank you very much.